doing? How's your week? I know you had a good week. I don't know. I had a good week. Um, so periodically, they let me have the microphone and let me get up here. And most of the time, I don't know what I'm going to say. And this morning, I do. This morning, I know what I want to say. I want to... Um, I know that I, I keep up with a lot of you on social media, and I see your posts, and uh, so I know how good your week has been, or I know how bad your week has been, or I know if you've been to Captain D's. <laughs> Who checks in at Captain D's? <laughs> he, he posted a food pic at Captain S. Anyway. So I want to tell you a story real quick. I know I only have like four minutes, so I'm going to tell you a really brief synopsis of a story that happened about in October of this past year. I took my family, my wife, my middle daughter, and my son, five-year-old Riley, who is, uh, have you ever heard the term, the apple didn't fall far from the tree? I'm pretty sure he's still connected at some point to me. He's just always 100 miles an hour. So we went to uh, the North Georgia mountains, and one, I didn't realize that Riley had never gone to a hotel room, so we walk in, and he, she's like, oh, there's a TV in here. I was like, yeah, buddy, there's a TV. It's a hotel room. He's like, so he goes over to the phone, and he picks up the phone. He says, what's this? I was like, that's a phone. He started pressing me. I said, stop. That's like $85. I'm calling KK. So we, we, we spend the night in a hotel. We get up the next morning. We go to a corn maze. And it was back in the October when it was like 90 degrees outside. So we go to Amicalola Falls. And we knew better than to try to get them to walk all the way up the falls. So we go up to the top of the falls and let them look over and see the falls. And then we go down at about middle ways. And it's the bottom of the falls. So you have to trek about 250 yards. And we go to the falls. And there's a path that's literally four, four feet wide. So on the way back... We're going and we take a picture of Riley and Jalen on this tree. And instead of climbing down the tree, Riley jumps off. And, and there's, a, there's a four foot path and then there's a 150 foot drop off. So, so Riley jumps off and he goes off the side of the mountain. And there's nothing. You can ask my wife. There's nothing that's there to stop that boy. That, I don't know if you've seen me with my son, but I love him. So I'm standing right here. Riley goes flying off the mountain. So I jumped to catch him. And if you ask my wife, every time she sees me run, she's like, that's the first time I've ever seen you run. I just saw him going off. And I knew the only thing I could think is I can't let that happen. I cannot let him go down there. So without a thought other than that, I jumped and I caught him. And the boy never hit the ground. And it was hot, so I had shorts on. So I'm sliding down the mountain on my legs. We slid down 15 feet, and there was one tree. It was this big around. And I reached out, and I'm not making any of this up. I caught the tree and stopped us. And it was so dry, and it was so steep that I couldn't get up. And I couldn't let go, and Bobby Joe was trying to come down. I was like, stop, I can't catch you and hold him. <laughs> and the whole day this place had been crowded. There's so many people. There was nobody. So I'm holding on for dear life, trying to figure out how am I going to get him up. And this old man comes by. He's probably, what, 90? And he starts coming. I was like, please don't do it. I'm not going to let go of my son, and you're going to fall. But we finally got up. Finally, some people came along. We made a chain, got Riley up. I was able to scurry up the mountain. And the point of the story is not that I jumped off the side of the mountain, which Bobby Joe said, that's the bravest and stupidest thing I've ever seen you do. <laughs> I was like, just like me to do, in, <laughs> incorporate bravery and stupidity. But from that point on, it, it's been a life lesson for me. How many times in my life have I been on the cliff or off the cliff and my father reached down and picked me up? I'll tell you what, Riley didn't have a scratch on him that day. 
which is amazing from where we were. It shouldn't have happened like that. And looking back at my life and how many times I've been on the edge or over the side or down that mountain, and my father reached down and picked me up. So where you are today does not, be, does not have to be where you are. That is not your lot in life. What you deserve is his love. What you deserve is his redemption. You've made no choice today or up to today that's preventing his love from saving you from that cliff. Just know you found a safe place to be today. Welcome. Stand with us.
15 it says I pray that God the source of hope will fill you with complete completely with joy and peace because you trust in him then you will overflow with confident hope through the whole power of the Holy Spirit the parts that step out to me are he will fill us with joy and peace because we trust in him we choose to trust in him we choose to allow that peace. We choose to allow that guidance. We choose to allow His love to pour into us because we, cho- because we trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident, confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit is there for us. He's there to guide us, to give us hope, to give us peace, to give us love, to give us joy when we have none of it. He is there to provide those things. We have to trust in Him. We have to choose moment by moment, not just daily, moment by moment to trust in Him, to trust in His guidance and His goodness. Amen.
how he's always there and ever present. I just got a glimpse of Dale and Nora, and I just was overwhelmed with thankfulness and just gratefulness that, you know, you you trusted and hoped and you've been through a lot, yet you're here saying he's so good. And um, that just blesses me so much. And um, earlier this week, um, I was just kind of in prayer, just kind of concerned about something and, and um, trying not to worry and things like that. And God just so sweetly reminded me of something he had told me a long time ago, just a promise he made to me. And I'd forgotten all about it. Can't tell you when I thought of it, you know, and he just so sweetly just remind, brought that back to my spirit. And it brought me such joy knowing that when we go through those trials, when we go through that fire, he has made promises and we're his. And it just, you know, I was telling a friend of mine, I said, it's only his goodness that he reminded me of that promise. That's just him being a good, good father. That's him just being good to me. And he's good to you. And this morning when you need him, and you, you may just need to hear his voice right now. You may just need to feel his presence right now while you're in the right place. And just open up your heart. Let go of some things that prohibit you from really seeing who he is in you. And allow him to just pour in and worship with us. Because he's good.
present within us. And I thank you today, Lord, for your everlasting goodness. We love you today, and together we say that. We say, we love you, Lord, and bless you today. Amen. Amen. I want to tell you about some people who's inspired me this week before I get into the message. And uh, first of all, this praise team ins inspires me every Sunday morning. And be <clears throat> we were, we had a praise team before praise teams was cool. We've had bands for a long, long time. We were criticized for years for having a band in church, and now they're all over the place. And um, But what I like about this band is that they're not only good at playing, they're excellent musicians, but to hear them read scriptures in between a song and preach a little bit, that's, you don't get that everywhere. They just play, but they, they play, sing, and preach. I like one time they came to Moses and said, Moses, they are prophesying in the camp. You need to stop them. And Moses said, I wish to God all of his people were prophets. All of his people were prophets. So let me tell you, that inspired me. Uh, Ken, you inspired me this week skiing with the grandkids big time. And so when I saw Jet skiing, I'm getting this knee fixed this year, and I'm going to ski with him next year. I, I, I just got inspired. You know, you can get inspired about a lot of things. And that's got spiritual, skiing with your grandkids. That's awesome. So I said, I'm getting this thing fixed, and me and Jet going to ski down the mountain. Now, another inspiration is Donnie and Darlene. Why don't you stand up? This is your anniversary today. Just thank you. And uh, I know you got five kids, but how many grandkids you got? Fifteen. Let me tell you why you inspire me. Is every now and then when I think keeping my three is a big deal, I think about y'all and it just lifts. It just, no, I just get so inspired. I say, I'd handle this. They'd handle 15, I'd handle three. I tell you what, God's good, isn't he? And uh, Jared Cordova, you called me Friday evening. Next time you want me to come over and grill me something, call me before a quarter to seven. Dude, I eat early. <laughs> but you called me and you said your wife and family was out of town and you invited me over for dinner and I'd already eaten, but I felt inspired to go. So I told Barbara, I said, I'm going over to Jared to spend a couple hours with him. I said, I just feel like I need to go over there. And I thought maybe I was going to come over there and bless you and talk to you. But man, you bless my socks off of what God's doing in your life. And thank you for inviting me over. And thank you for inspiring me to just keep on keeping on. Thank you. Amen. Amen. God is good. I uh, want to take you back to 2 Peter chapter 1. I can't get away from this. And uh, I'm taking you back there because... I, uh, I didn't deal with the first two verses. And uh, years ago, I preached, and after I preached, we went out to lunch, as we often do. And Barbara looked at me, and she said, that was a great introduction. And I was waiting for the rest. And I wasn't about to ask, well, what about the rest? Because... I could tell by the inflection in her voice that the introduction was the message and the rest of it really didn't matter. So I want to take you back to 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 and I want to give you the introduction to what really, I mean, you know, sometimes those first couple of verses in uh, an epistle says a whole, whole lot. And these first two verses, I went back and looked at them. They are filled with such power. Look at it with me, 2 Peter chapter 1. This letter is from Simon Peter. Now, it's important, just that word Simon means everything. Because when Simon Peter's, a lot of times it's just mentioned Peter. But when it says Simon Peter, it's only mentioned a few times in the scripture. And when it's mentioned Simon Peter, he's opening doors for people. He's opening doors for people. Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And they said, his disciples said, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist risen from the dead. But Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ. You're the son of the living God. 
And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Bartona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this unto thee, but my Father in heaven. And thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And I thought about keys, and I was talking to Ralph this week. Keys is only good for two things, locking a door or unlocking a door. Locking a door or unlocking a door. I want to use my keys to unlock some doors and let some people out, don't you? I want to open doors and not shut doors. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you stand at the door and you don't let anybody else in and you don't go in yourself. I want, I want to be a door opener. So he says, Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ, I'm writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. The faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Aren't you glad it's about more and more? Aren't you glad the best really is yet to come? And it really is. He said, I, I just don't want to give you this now. I want to give you more, and I want to give you more. Right. You know, I want to say something, and I want you to listen to the end of it because it sounds like I'm contradicting myself, some things I've said in the past. But everybody seeks for happiness and joy and peace. I don't know of anyone in life who doesn't seek after happiness and joy and peace. I want to tell you, the only way to happiness and joy and peace it's not in what you have it's not even in your relationships it's how you live your life because if you don't live your life right it doesn't matter how much you have or how many relationships you have because if you don't live your life right the relationships are going to fall apart anyway and so it's all about living my life Right. Peter opened doors. Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 13. This is what, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You see, Peter's writing to the Gentiles. Peter was the apostle sent to the Gentiles. And he says, you were, all, you were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days you were living apart from Christ, you were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. You did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. Oh, aren't you glad that Jesus came and tore down the, the middle wall of partition? Aren't you glad that he came and said, now whosoever will may come? It doesn't matter. You see, in Christ there's no male, there's no female there's no bond there's no free there's no jew there's no gentile we're all one in christ and then in uh, romans uh or first peter 2 10 it says this once you had no identity as a people now you're god's people once you received no mercy now you have received god's mercy isn't that great then he says in Romans 3, 21 and 22. But now God has shown us a way to be right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Wow. Mm. Those are... Simple scriptures, but gosh, they're filled. They're filled with love. They're filled with passion. They're filled with openness. They're filled with whosoever will. Whosoever will may come and drink of this water. Whosoever will now can enter into the holy of Whosoever will can come into the very presence of God. And we can sing that song that you're just singing. Lord, make us more aware of your presence see it's not god be present among us make us more aware of your presence because he's always there we just have to be aware of his presence 
will make us aware of your presence. I, I wrote this down about growing in knowledge, and I, I thought, what is growing in knowledge? I'm going to give you my definition of it. You can take it or leave it. It doesn't matter to me right now. Implementing what you know. That's knowledge. Implementing what you know. See, knowledge is experiential knowledge. It's you experienced it. The Bible says Adam knew his wife. He experienced an intimate relationship with his wife. and They gave birth. You see, knowing is implementing. A lot of people got it, but they don't have it. They, it's up here, but it's not here. Until it gets here, it's what it really, really, really matters. Amen? All right. I'm glad you're enjoying this. Now, let's get to how am I going to live my life? Right? Isn't that what it's about? How am I going to do it? And so, I'm going to read these verses again, but I'm going to give you a little more stuff with it this time. I'm going to dig a little deeper. Not, not deep, 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 simple deep. You know, you, people used to say, Beard, you need to be more. The guy came to me one time. He said, man, you just need to preach more deeper. I, you, <laughs> you know why some people like to be so deeper? Because you can, you can have this deep stuff and still treat your wife wrong. Want to know how many wings are on a seraphim like that's going to mean something you, you need to know how much spirit of God is in you and how you're living it out my daddy I remember I was at the altar years ago and I think I've told this story before but my daddy was praying for this man to be filled with the Holy Spirit and his wife was standing next to him and daddy he had these big old hands and he's just laying his hands on this man Lord fill him with the Holy Spirit fill him with the Holy Spirit and his wife next to him said, don't do it, Lord, he leaks. <laughs> and I, I think sometimes that's, <laughs> we got holes in us anyway. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, by his divine power, say divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Everything we need. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Just leave that up there because I want to allude back to it in a moment. Let me tell you what the difference in divine power is. There's a lot of power in the world. A lot of power but there's not a lot of divine power divine power is unconquerable power it's the greatest power of all powers you see a guy may win the championship somebody's going to come along later on a little stronger than he is and going to take it from him and somebody's going to break have this record and somebody's going to come along and break that record but let me tell you something my brother-in-law is here, and he's, he's, a, he's the strongest 65-year-old man in the world. He deadlifted more weight than anybody his age in the world. But somebody's going to break that, Randall. I hate to tell you, but somebody's going to break it. He walked in the house at Christmas after he'd done that, and I said, ain't this amazing that our family? He said, what? I said, we got the strongest 65-year-old in the world and the best-looking 65-year-old. Is that amazing, our family? Is... <laughs> Is blessed like that, but if somebody's going to break that, I'm not. Somebody will, but divine power is unconquerable. Nobody's going to ever top divine power. Nobody's going to ever do what God's done. Nobody's going to ever have the power that God's had. And he says, I've given you this divine power, this triumphant, unconquerable power that I can win every battle. Every battle I can win. I love that. I love restoration. I really do. But I get <laughs> restoration is hard, folks. Restoration is hard. I love it. Thank God for restoration. Thank God for it. But it, it ain't easy. It's a whole lot easier just to win the battle to start with. It's a whole lot easier just to <laughs> conquer that thing in the beginning than got to come back and clean up the mess. Amen. Anybody ever made a mess? 
I mean, how many know it's a lot easier to keep the house clean than going, waiting, letting it get to a certain place and then cleaning it? Right. Anybody know it's easier to just keep the desk clean than let, every now, I, about once a month I clean my desk. It takes me about 30 minutes instead of just keeping it that way all the time. And once I get it that way, I just love it. It looks so neat. I, and I, I'm smarter when I sit down at it. Yeah, I'm just smarter. Yeah, I, but when I don't, I mean, it's all messed up. I feel like a klutz because I am one. But to get it cleaned up, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I just, you just look like you're really enjoying it. Nobody. <laughs> all right. Promises or provision. He's given us, he's provided what we need for everything in life. Everything. He's provided it. Now, I'm going to jump ahead to the promise. Before I get to the promise, I want to tell you what, because the promise enables you. The promise enables you. I said the promise enables you. There's a difference. Many people are waiting for God to fulfill the promise. He says, my promise enables you to do it. That's good stuff. That's good, ain't Billy? That's good. You know, Abraham was going up the side of the mountain with his son to offer him a sacrifice, and there was a ram going up the other side of the mountain. You know why the ram was going up the other side of the mountain? You know why the promise was going up the other side of the mountain? You know why the provision was going up the other side of the mountain? Because Abraham was going up the other side of the mountain. No sense in anything happening unless you're going up the mountain. You see... Do something. I uh, shared this term. I, I, I think I coined a new term. I probably didn't. I'm sure somebody in this world has this. How many love replacement thinking? That's not what I coined. I got, I got something else to go along with it. How many love replacement? Now, if you, if you, in case you don't know what it is, let me tell you what it is. Replacement thinking is when you have a negative thought, you don't just do away with a negative thought. You come back and replace it with a positive thought. See, the absence of negativity in your life is not being positive. That's neutral. You have to not only get rid of the negative thought, you've got to replace the negative thought, and you're better to replace it with more than just one. Replace that negative thought. It's called replacement thinking. When I learned that years ago, it's been awesome in my life, awesome in your life. Because I realized I would always been good about getting negative stuff out of my life. But I hadn't been that good replacing it. Well, I got a new term to go along with replacement thinking, reverse thinking. Sometimes we just say it wrong. It's right, but it's backwards. Raf calls that something else, but I can't say what he calls that here. Y'all can't. <laughs> but y'all know what it is. It's called back. Anyway. We need to learn to reverse our thinking. We're not growing in God. God needs to be growing in us. Jesus was growing in Mary. Mary wasn't growing in Jesus. We, it... Sometimes we have it right, but we just have it backwards. We just, you know, my daddy used to say, I would if I could. We can turn that around and say, I could if I would. He just was in a class this past week and read this definition, Paul Poesy, about forgiveness. He says, forgiveness doesn't change the past. It just enlarges our future. You see, the reason some people can't forgive is that thing's going to deal with the past. No, it's going to deal with your future. It has nothing to do with the past. It has everything to do with what's going to happen the next day, the next day, and the next day. Because when I do away, and when you take forgiveness and turn it around, it's give for. You're giving it for a good reason. And you're giving up judgmentalism and grudges and resentments. Isn't that a good thing to give up? 
Forgiveness. God chose forgiveness to redeem the world. He chose forgiveness to redeem the world. He chose forgiveness to rescue all of us. And he forgave you before you ever asked him to forgive you. We're going to be talking next month about a word I haven't talked about in a long time called covenant. Covenant. We, we see covenant as a two-way street. I, I do my part and you do your part. God sees covenant as a one-way street. I do my part whether you do your part or not. If we could just come together like that in relationships, whether you do your part, I'm going to do mine. That's covenant. See, Barbara did her part in my life sometimes when I wasn't doing my part because she loved me and she still did it because that's what covenant does. It takes up the slack. See, everybody, everywhere along the way, somebody's going to carry the relationship. I'm backing, I'm backing up preaching a message I preached several months ago. But sometimes somebody's got to carry the relationship, and it's okay to carry it. Okay, I'd say two of you. Let me say it another way. You better carry that relationship if you want to see it go to, the, to be married this long. You better carry the relationship. It's okay to carry the relationship. It's okay. Barbara and I have been married, you know, sometimes 43? Four? No, not no. Really? I missed a year. Oh, 44 years. Yeah, 44 years. And there have been times she carried it, been times I carried it. That's okay. Amen? It's been, it's been worth it. I love these notes, but I'm loving what I'm feeling inside more than I'm loving these notes. I'm trying, <laughs> trying to stick here and trying to go there. But you know what? I just do both. Is that all right? Yeah. Did you come to get a word today? Did you come to receive one? Right, that's a key. You come to receive it. You come with an open heart, an open mind, an open spirit. Say, God, like, talk to me. See, I, I don't get up here and just preach to you. I, I preach to me all week long. And I'm going to give you, I'm, I'm going to let you have it just the way he gave it to me. Is that all right? We all need it, don't we? You share the same faith that I have. You share the same faith that Peter had. You share the same faith that Apostle Paul had. You share the same faith that Peter and John had when they came to the temple and a man there asking for alms, thinking he was there for one particular thing, and they, and they looked at Peter and John, and Peter and John looked at him and said, We don't have any money. We don't have what you want, but we have what you need. Oh, man, that's good. Sometimes it's not what we want, it's what we need. He says, we don't have what you want, but we have what you need. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. How many, are, how many know that that man was so glad they didn't have any money? He was. How many know that if you had cancer, you'd give every penny in your bank to be cured? If you was crippled, you'd give every penny in your bank to walk again. You would give up everything for that. Man, he says, silver and gold we don't have, but what we have we're going to give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then he says, because you've been given this power, because I have provided you this, I've given you a promise that's going to enable you, enable you, enable you, I just can't say that enough. Enable you to do what needs to be done. What? Back up a minute. Silver and gold we don't have. What we do have is a promise that's going to enable us to reach down and take you by the hand pull you up on your feet I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enact the knowledge I know the promise that I've been given has enabled me to give to you and so he says now seeing this in verse 5 now because 
you see, in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Huh, do what? Somebody told me one time, said, man, Beard, you prophecy over me, none of it's come to pass. I said, really? None of it. None of it. I said, well, did you know the Bible says war a good war warfare over the prophecy spoken over you? Because you've got a prophecy doesn't mean it's going to happen if you don't war a good warfare over it. you got a part to do with it. God called me to preach years ago, and I, I thought, he called me to preach. It just give me words to say. No, it, I, I tried that a few times. It, now, it worked. That he will help. He will give you stuff to say, but if you don't study, he won't. Study to show yourself approved, a workman that, right, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Ken, I got... I was standing at the, at that looking outside my uh, a window in my backyard, and that scripture came to me, and I got to thinking. I said, what does it mean, the workman that need not be ashamed? He says, because when you say something dumb and it ain't true, you're going to be ashamed. Oh, wow. That, you know what I, I thought this morning? I thought, I'm going to study more. I don't want to be ashamed. I don't like shame. Okay. That was for me. Had nothing to do for you. Just me. Supplement your faith. What faith? The faith that you see who you are. The faith that now that you see who you really are, let it bring about this moral excellence or this true life. Not just life, true life. Man, I saw on Dr. Oz the other day. What's her name, Barbara? Huh? Kathy, Kathy Lee Gifford. That woman was preaching. Preaching. And man, she was talking about, the, she said, and I thought, you go girl. She said, she looked at Dr. Oz. She said, you know, God came to give us Life. And she said, that's not just any life. And she said, it's Zoe life. I said, you go, girl. That's a great word, Zoe life. It means life full of abundance and goodness and greatness. I said, why you preach? I mean, that girl was preaching up a storm. Wow. I used to not like her. <laughs> I had no reason not to like her. I mean, no, I don't know. Why. I just, that's stupid. I, do, I love her. You better watch. You don't know. I've told you, I was on an airplane, my, me and my dad, and he was in the back, and I was in the front of the plane. I was sitting next to this woman. She looked like a Jezebel. I mean, she looked like one. She smelled like one. And I, I went back, and I talked to Daddy a minute. and said, what? You doing ice? I said, yeah. I said, I'm sitting next to a Jezebel. He said, yeah. I said, oh, yeah. She's a, I know she's a prostitute. Daddy said, how you know? I said, I just know. I went back up, true story, I sat down. She said, she reached down under the seat and pulled out a satchel and brought, pulled a Bible out. Opened a Bible, got a notes out. And I'm looking. <laughs> I said, uh, where are you going? She said, I'm headed to a conference, a women's conference to speak. <laughs> I felt, and she looked, she looked at me and said, where are you going? And I, inside, I said, to hell. <laughs> Just, <laughs> to, to hell. <laughs> so, because I felt like it. I mean, it actually... If he had opened the gates of hell, I'd have just walked. Through, I'd, have thund, I'd rather just walked in the gates of hell for a few moments than, than to ride the rest of that airplane <laughs> with her. And so we got off the plane. I wouldn't say it much. And Daddy said, what's wrong? I said, you know, the woman I told you was this. He said, yeah, she ain't. She's not. People aren't nearly what you think they are. See, we're all created in the likeness and the image of God. And you better be careful what you say about God's image. Oh, 
Ooh, better be careful what you say about God's image. Ooh, I want to say that again. Better be careful what you say about God's image because we're all being created in the likeness and in the image of God. We don't know that. A lot of people don't know that. But because they don't know that don't mean it's not true. There's a lot of things I don't know, but it doesn't mean it's not true. He said, add to this, now that you see who you are, then you can live this life. Then you can add this knowledge to it. You can implement it even more. And then you can, to that, you can have self-control. You ever, you ever said to yourself, I just have no self-control. Yes, you do. You have the divine nature of God. You have self-control. And you have self-control, you have patience, endurance. And you've got patient endurance, you've got godliness, and you've got, you got brotherly affection. And then you've got love for everyone. Why? Because you already have it. You don't have to pray, God, give me patience. You have patience. You have to implement patience. You already have it. Uh, this may help some of you. I've been, uh, I, I got a revelation this week, and it's working. Oh, gosh, it's working. But I'm having, I'm having to tell myself this over and over again, over and over again. I've been wanting to lose some weight. I ain't no, no big old boy or nothing, but I want to lose some weight. And uh, especially because I, I gather all my weight in one place, and I want to lose it. And, I, and so I started thinking about how I could do this. And I knew one thing I could do. I did that. And, uh, and then this revelation came to me, Keith. It doesn't take that much food to live. Now that may not, it doesn't take that much food to live. It doesn't take that much food to live. You don't, you really don't need that much food to get the nutrients you really need from it. Because most of it's going to go to fat. You don't need that much food. And so I've been telling myself, and uh, over and over again for the last four days, you don't need that much food. And I thought it would reverse on me and I get more hungry. The more I've said that, the less hungry I've been. And I keep convincing myself, you don't need that much food. You've got to keep telling yourself who you really are, what you really need. And you keep telling yourself over and over and over again. And it has been amazing to me in the last four days what that has done in my life. Telling myself over and over again. You don't need that much food. Now. I want to close this. What happens if I do this, if I believe this, this is what happens. Because the next few verses says, the more you grow like this, the more you'll be productive and useful. You'll be in the knowledge of your Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting but they've been cleansed from their old sins. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things. You'll never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, before that goes away up there, I want you to look at that again. <clears throat> because he's not saying, if you do all this, you'll get to heaven. It's not what he's saying. If, if you'll see yourself this way, you'll have a grand entrance into the kingdom. Paul said the kingdom of God is not meat nor drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with going to heaven. It has everything to do with living heaven here. I saw a post this week. and I... Uh, they were talking about and bragging about how many people were going to hell. And really, I mean, I, I, 
And he even brought this scripture, said, well, you know, the Bible, I'm going to say it the way I read it, okay, because I know how they wrote it. You know, the Bible says, narrow is the way that leads unto life, and few there be who find it, but broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many go in thereby. It has nothing to do with heaven. It has everything to do with life. You go through Christ, you come into this abundant life. He said, I'm going to give you this abundant entrance. I want you to have an abundant life. I want you to have an abundant life. It ain't about, let me tell you what. There's a lot of people going to heaven. I won't really tell you what I really feel about that, but I want to tell you what. There's a lot more people going to heaven than most denominations know about. And some people have to put them in another room, Jason, because they're going to say, who's, out, who's that in the other room? That's all those you didn't think was going. A lot more people. I mean, I, I want to go to heaven. I'm not, I'm not really worried about that one. I'm really not. I'm not worried about that. That one's checked off. Die, heaven. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. That one's checked off. I'm concerned about how you live here. I'm concerned about how I live here. I'm concerned about my joy and peace and happiness now. Now. Now, this day, this moment. Concerned about my relationships now, this moment. Concerned about then. That's all fine then. Everything's fine. <laughs> my mother's so... So, Daddy, and uh, she, she got this big old smile on her face. She has tears, but they were tears of joy. I mean, they were just tears of joy. And uh, Barbara said, Big Mama, you see Big Daddy? She said, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And so Barbara wanted to stretch her a little bit more and said, Do you see Aunt Kate? Do you see Aunt Kate? <laughs> Mama just kind of went, and so Barbara said, Ain't Kate's there? I said, Yeah, Ain't Kate's there. But she's probably in a school getting to know a little bit more, but she's there. <laughs> Just kidding. But they're, they're there. We have a cloud of witnesses encouraging us. You know what they're encouraging you? Not to get to heaven. They encourage you to be victorious over this life. Why are people in the stands yelling for their team to win the game? on the field the cloud of witnesses that surround us are not encouraging you to go to heaven they're encouraging you to win the battle here be victorious here we're cheering you on you can do it you know I, I miss mother but let me tell you something I'm, I'm stronger now I'm wiser now I see more than I will see you, you say, I don't know about that. I do. Because she's there, I'm seeing more than I've seen. I'm understanding more than I've understood. I, I've got another person in the cloud of witnesses up there. And, buddy, she is cheering me on. And she's saying, go get them, boy. Go get them, boy. Study more, boy. Preach more, boy. Prophesy more, boy. See more, boy. You my boy. A cloud of witnesses. cloud of witnesses I was standing right here about I think Jared you told me it's 2010 Jared got on to the altar and he was coming by I grabbed him and said whoa boy I said this year you're going to have a huge blessing huge and I went over there that he told me what happened he had never mentioned that to me in seven years, he hadn't mentioned that to me. He said, let me tell you the huge blessing. You don't really remember it, do you? I said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Let me tell you the huge blessing I got. And I, and I went, this is, what I, this is what I said inside. Dang, boy, you got, I ain't got that kind of huge blessing. You got more than I got. I ain't right, Joy. I ain't right. You know what? Well, I just got a revelation. I'm going to claim that one for me. 
I'm going to get that. I claim that for me. Amen. Let's stand. You're here. Maybe you've told yourself, I'm not this, I'm not that. I don't have self-control. I don't have patience. You know, that's a short passage of Scripture. How many know, though, in that passage of Scripture, self-control, patient endurance, brotherly kindness, love, knowledge. How many know that's everything? That's huge. That's huge. And if you're here this morning and you're lacking in some of that, you're short-sighted. You can't see afar off. God wants you to see afar off. He wants you to see down the road. He wants you to see down the road. How many are glad that God's a God who will show you down the road? He wants to show you down the road so you're not surprised. Let me tell you something about God. God's never done this. Oh, wow. I didn't expect that. God's never done that. And he don't want you to have to do that too often either. You're here and you want to begin this journey of faith of seeing yourself as self-control, patient endurance, brotherly kindness, love. You, you, want to, you want to function from that standpoint? Huh? See, it's reverse thinking. Some people think, I got to get there to be that. You are here to get there. You get that? You're here already. You already have it. Now, it will be implemented in your life when you see you already got it. You ain't going to get it. You got it. I had to stop praying a certain way. I, pray. I used to pray coming come to church. God, give me the words to say. God, anoint me with the Holy Spirit. God, do this. Do I do that? I had to stop praying that way in reverse. God, I'm going to release your anointing today. I'm going to release your word today. I'm going to release your blessings today. I'm going to release your power today. I just had to change what I was saying. I already got it. Just release it. Amen. Just come and stand and say, I want to begin a new journey. I want to begin this posture from faith of seeing who God says I am and seeing who I really, really am. I want to begin, I want to get in this journey. Come on, that right now, there's several you need to come. I'm going to come get you if you don't come. I see you. I, you know I'm getting bold. Come on down. You're gonna, I'm going to start this journey. tell you something about that this song and uh that's the praise team just to come on you just keep playing with the praise team to come i'm gonna tell you something about this song i found out this is life as life goes on the more i need you more it gets it doesn't get more uncomplicated paul it gets more complicated you're about to see that in May, you're going to get married. Life's not going to get uncomplicated. It's going to get more complicated, but it's going to be good. It's not to scare you. You're just going to need more. You need more. I need more. The older I get, the more I get. Billy Woodward told me years ago, Beard, don't you think life's going to get more simple as you get older? It's going to get more complicated. You got one kid, you're going to have grandkids. You live long enough, the grandkids are going to have grandkids. <laughs> oh, that's scary. I need you more and more. I want more knowledge. I want more understanding. It's a new beginning for you today. A brand new beginning for you today. And the Lord wants you to just forget the past and reach forth unto the future. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, I reach forward. I press toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And let me tell you what the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus is, is reaching my full potential in Christ at that moment. You see, God wants you to be able to, this moment, live your full potential that you have right now. Now, that potential is not going to be the same potential next week or next year. It'll grow more. My potential right now, I want to know I'm reaching my full potential this moment. I want to know I'm giving you the ver I'm giving you the fullest I can give you this moment out of my heart and spirit. I want to know I'm, I'm reaching in and pulling out to my fullest potential what I can do. It's not going to be enough next year, but right now it can be enough. Your full potential you're going to come to. You didn't come here by accident. It didn't happen happen chance. 
your best is yet to come. Father, in the name of Christ, I thank you that every one of these people standing here today share the same faith, the same faith, the same faith as Peter and Paul, as Moses, as all the great prophets of all. We all share the very same faith. We see ourselves that we're who we really are, that we're in you and you're in us. And we decide to live from this posture the rest of our life, not trying to get self-control, I am self-control. Not trying to get patience, I am patient. Not trying to become, I already am. And out of that posture flows the goodness and the blessings of God and life. Not just life, true life. True, true life. True life. Amen. Some people live their whole life and never live. That's the saddest thing. They live their whole life and yet they never live. I came that you might have life. You might have it more abundantly. Now before you get home, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Before you get home, somebody is going to speak in your ear and going to tell you the opposite of what I said. And who's going to tell you that? It's not the devil. It's you. And so you're going to have to tell yourself again what was said. And you keep telling yourself that and telling yourself that and telling yourself that and telling yourself that. And te- I don't care if you've got to tell yourself that a hundred times a day. If you'll tell yourself a hundred times a day, I'm going to tell myself who I am. It don't take that much food to live. That's not what you needed. I'd look. <laughs> has nothing to do with you. I mean, look. Don't tell yourself the opposite. Okay? Don't just replace the thought. Reverse the thought. Okay? All right? Bless you in Jesus' name. For the power and the goodness of God resides so in you. It's resided in you all your life. And you've lived for the day where you could just see it release and flow from you. And the Lord says to you today that the day of wondering is over. The day of wondering is over. And the day of reality is present. And the goodness and the goodness of God. And you're going to taste the goodness of God in the land of the living. In the land of the living. Amen. 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 God bless you. Keep on keeping on. Keep on keeping on. Amen. As they're singing the song, the ushers is becoming. Thank you for allowing us to have Mother's funeral on Sunday morning. And thank you that we didn't receive an offering. And thank you for being faithful and sending your money in, sending your tithes and offering ends, hitting that button. Thank you. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was such, I, I was going to tell, I was going to have the, the ushers in the back and, and, and receive the offerings as people's going out. And I was going to tell you, you better give because Big Mama's looking. Well, I want to tell you right now, you better give. Big Mama's still looking. So bless you as you worship, as you give. And let's just rejoice with these singers today. And Okay? Amen. Let's do it.